This lecture today is on the body composition. And body composition is defined as the body's relative amount of fat mass versus or in fat free mass. So it's really a ratio of the amount of fat, the mass of that fat versus the mass of fat free mass. So fat mass is going to include the adipose tissue. Whereas the fat free mass is the mass of the bones, water, muscle, and connective and organ tissue. Includes things like the teeth as well, and other non fat or non adipose type tissue. Now, when we look at this relative to total body weight or total body mass, compare that total body weight that is fat, this is known as a percent. Body fat. And as you can see over here in this figure, male versus female, you can see that there are differences in muscle and there are differences in bone weight and difference in all the other stuff, things like the water, other organ tissues and all that. And then you have two sources of fat, fat that's considered to be essential, and we'll talk about that in just a second, low. Uh, in males, higher in females, 2% males, 12% females, and then we have non-essential or storage fat. And the average male carries around about 12%, the average female about 15%. It's better to have much lower amounts of non-essential fat uh, than the 12 to 15% that's shown here. This is just the average between males and females. It's, it's much better to be closer to the just total essential fat. At two, uh, at three to, to twelve percent. So the essential fat. Well, before I do that, the, the, this individual here, out of both sources of fat, this individual would have a a fifteen percent body fat, and this individual over here would have a twenty-seven percent body fat. So the essential fat. It's essential because it is crucial for normal body function. So it is crucial for normal body function. And without this essential fat, some of our physiological processes begin to work inefficiently. So for males, it's about 3 to 5% of the total body weight total body mass. So 3 to 5% of your total body mass should come from this central fat. That's again in males. In females, the total composition of fat should be between 8 and 12%. Again, of our total body mass. So 8 to 12% of the total body mass should be attributed to this essential fat in females. On the converse, the non-essential fat is what we call adipose tissue. Essential fat is typically associated with organs and helps those help so those organs to be able to function. Whereas the non-essential fat is stored up in this tissue called adipose tissue. So these are going to be areas where we have accumulation of 
fat, fat cells, adipose cells, making up this adipose tissue. An individual who is overweight will have a total body weight or body mass where this non-essential fat, this adipose tissue or the storage fat is above recommended range. individual who has an excessive amount above and beyond what's required for good health would be considered overweight. An individual who has a severely abundant amount of adipose tissue is severely overweight and also considered to be Fat. So both overweight and obesity are going to be characterized to varying degrees by excessive accumulation of this non-essential fat. Excessive accumulation of the non excessive body fat. Now, currently in the United States, you can see in this figure from the 1960s to 2000 that we've had uh, an increase in both overweightness and obesity and increase in obesity. Now, this is a major problem because there are some adverse effects. to having this excess body fat. Individuals with additional excess body fat, especially those individuals who remain physically inactive, are at much higher risks for chronic diseases. Higher risk for premature Death, they will exhibit unhealthy blood fat levels. And will also exhibit impaired heart function. Because of this impaired heart function, the high levels of blood fat, individuals who are overweight and obese have a higher prevalence of heart disease, and high blood pressure, and hypertension. Furthermore, individuals with high levels of body fat are at much higher risk for cancer. This figure here you can see as you go from normal weight to obesity here on the x-axis, this is your relative risk for death from cancer. And as you go towards obesity, you can see that we have both in men and women this severe upward trend where the risk is uh, in obese individuals one and a half or more times likely for death from cancer. Individuals who are excessively overweight or obese also have impaired immune function higher rates of gallbladder disease higher rates of kidney disease skin problems, and sleeping problems.
all of these problems associated with excessive body fat is why it is said that in the United States we have an obesity epidemic. And we've already gone through some uh, principles and some ways in which we can help to maintain the overall health of, uh, of an individual and also to maintain a healthy body weight through cardiorespiratory endurance training and muscular and uh, strength and endurance training. And so we've already dealt with some ways in which we can ward off the effects of overweightness and obesity. So I'm not going to belabor that point. Uh, but I also want to talk about individuals who are on the opposite side of the, pers uh, of the spectrum. And they have excessively low body fat. So these are going to be individuals that have body fat levels that are lower than the required essential fat levels. So for women, less than 10 to 12 percent of the total body mass attributed to fat. And for men, this will be less than 5 percent for men. So we're talking about for women as they get closer to more like 6 and 5 percent body fats and for men closer to 2 percent body fat. So even on this low side, there's also some associated issues and concerns. Individuals with excessively low body fat have reproductive system malfunction. Reproductive malfunction, also reductions in circulatory compliance. Function of the heart is actually reduced. The ability for the heart to move blood around the general circulation is reduced. We also know that low body fat levels are associated with immune system dysfunction and disorder. So the, the kind of big take home message as we begin this lecture is that Excessive body fat is problematic, and excessively low body fat is also problematic. So we want to keep right in this range of 3 to 5 percent for men, and between 8 and 12 percent women, that kind of essential fat is going to be ideal. Now, in addition to just overall body fat percentage or amount of fat that's attributed to the total body weight, the fat distribution and how that fat is held on the body, where it is located in the body, is also going to be important as we consider uh, the effects of adipose tissue on health and wellness. So fat distribution, you can see, can end up in a variety of different locations. And in these cases here, in the individuals in the red swimming suits, there's a higher amount of fat that's, that's higher on the body, closer towards these visceral organs of the heart and the lungs and the liver. Whereas this individual in the green bathing suit has more weight distributed or more fat distributed, much lower on the organism, less of that weight distributed up towards those visceral organs. And that distribution is actually going to be uh, very important, and it also has uh, some uh, drastic effects on health. So this idea of fat distribution, location is important when it comes to health. So these first two examples here in red exhibit what's known as an abdominal distribution. And you have maybe heard the colloquial term for these individuals as being an apple shape. The idea is that the overall 
shape is more apple-like, higher up on top, less mass down here on the bottom. So the apple-shaped individual, or the individual with the higher rate of abdominal fat distribution, packs fat around the visceral organs. And the visceral organs are going to include the heart and the lungs and the liver. And in particular, the heart and the lungs have an additional fat, this so-called storage fat or non-essential fat surrounding them reduces their function significantly. It results in things like increases in risk for coronary heart disease which is a type of heart disease that affects the vessels that supply blood. It supplies blood to the heart itself. Individuals with the apple shape are going to have a higher we have a higher or the increased risk for hypertension. prevalence of diabetes, <laughs> higher risk for stroke, and a few other types of diseases as well. Now, looking at the second individual here in green, the distribution we have here is centered around the hip area. These are colloquially called hair shapes. Now, with this pear shape, all of these risks are greatly reduced. So just by distributing our fat around the hips rather than around the visceral organs, we have reductions in the risk for coronary heart disease, risk for higher blood pressure, a risk for prevalence, uh, or a risk for diabetes rather, and, and that risk for stroke. So having that lower fat distribution is going to have less risk. So how is body composition, both the amount of fat mass and fat-free mass, and then the distribution of that tissue, how is body composition relate to wellness and overall wellness? Well, individuals with a less than desirable body composition, higher percentage of body fat, has a decreased ability to perform physical activity. On the other side of this spectrum, individuals who maybe have a abnormal desire for low body fat levels can exhibit unrealistic expectations. Unrealistic expectations about their body composition. And this can oftentimes hurt this concept known as self-image, or the way that you view yourself. Now, obviously, we want to have a positive self-image of ourselves. This is going to be more psychologically and emotionally healthy. One of the ways in which we can deal with a lower or a negative self-image is through exercise. Exercise does improve 
body image. Exercise also improves body fat and the body fat effects. It's supposed to be an and sign. Let's put it a plus there. So body fat and its effects. So exercise becomes really important. We've already discussed some of the ways in which we can incorporate different types of exercise, cardio respiratory endurance type training, muscle strength, muscle uh, endurance, and flexibility. Body composition can also be trained. So you can undergo a training program to improve your body composition, to defend against those disease risks that we've talked about to improve your overall self-image. Now, just like with other training, it's always important to start out with a goal. So it's important to set realistic, achievable goals. And one recommendation here, if you're trying to lose weight, is to set a goal where you're looking at losing about a half a pound in a seven-day period, about a half a pound per week. Another goal that you may set that can really go along nicely with body composition changes is a goal to maintain a wellness lifestyle. Now, it seems like this goal here is really small, only a half a pound of body weight a week. And this goal here is very hard to measure. However, but even though we cannot measure our wellness our wellness lifestyle very effectively, it's very important to note that by increasing your physical activity and exercise, immediately response of the body is to have decreases in a variety of different variables, such as hypertension, decrease in blood lipid levels, decrease in cholesterol. These are more difficult to measure. A lot of times you have to go and have a, a medical professional draw blood or measure your blood pressure. So this is something that uh, you don't necessarily measure on a, on a frequent basis, but it's still an important goal when it comes to body composition. All right, so if we set our goals, it's going to be nice to start out with a concrete picture of where we are. So how can one go through and quantify body composition? There's a couple different tests. Some of them are very expensive to perform. But there are also some that are much easier to perform. They may not be as accurate, but they still give you that, that big picture and are usable technique to quantify body composition. Uh, so the pictures that you're seeing here, things like uh, a DEX, DEXA, which is using x-rays and different absorption of x-rays to uh, quantify where fat and fat-free masses are located within an individual. Down here is underwater weighing, which is the gold standard technique. It requires an underwater weighing tank filled with water. The idea here is that fat-free mass and fat mass have two different densities. Fat mass has a lower density than water. Fat-free mass has a higher density of water. So the ratio of your body weight uh, on land versus in the tank will give you an idea of the fat mass that's present. Glod pod here, this uses uh, air uh, displacement to evaluate uh, your body composition. And the, the less expensive or the most inexpensive technique of the four that are shown here is to use skin, uh, skin calipers or, or skin fold calipers to measure the subcutaneous fat, the fat that's at the surface. And then you can plug those values from a variety of sites on the body, things like here, uh, the front of the leg, also up in the abdomen, on the back, just below the, the scapula, on the arm, over the tricep. These are sites that you may measure with a skinfold caliper. Plug those values into an equation and get a, a decent estimate of your body composition. All of these techniques require equipment that's beyond 
what can be purchased by the normal consumer. So we can use some rough assessment tools that don't require expensive or hard to use uh, equipment that requires a well-trained technician. One of the most common rough assessments that can be used is a statistic called body mass index, or just simply BMI. And you've probably had or have calculated your BMI. Uh, we'll go through that very quickly. Here's an example of BMI, uh, and you can see that we get a number, and then that number is going to correlate with whether you're underweight, healthy weight, overweight, or obese, and you can see that there are changes that occur in the individual and what their, uh, what their shadow or their silhouette would look like. So the way we calculate a body mass index is to take a person's weight, you can do this on a scale, and we take it in proportion to their height. And the idea is that a person's weight should be proportional to the height. that we would use for body mass index is to take the individual's body weight and we're going to measure that in kilograms. And then we're going to divide that or take that in proportion to the square of the individual's height. So you would measure the height in meters and you would square that value. So you can do that for yourself. You can plug in your body mass in kilograms, measure your height in meters, take it as a square, and then calculate that ratio. And you'll typically be in the range of about 20 to uh, about 30 for most college-age students, unless you are underweight or severely obese. So how can we actually, after we've quantified our body composition, begin to make some changes and maybe shift from being obese or overweight closer to being overweight or, or, or even a healthy weight, or maybe go in the other direction and increase some of your fat? Well, there's two things that are going to be critically important here. You already know one of these things, and that's just to continue on your training for cardiorespiratory endurance, muscle strength, and muscle endurance. So just simply use the FIT principle that you've already learned and continue to train those different areas of fitness. The second thing that will be critical here is to make some changes to your lifestyle. In addition to your normal old training regimens, it's also important to have regular physical activity. And so you may need to go about evaluating your day-to-day -day activity and see if you can incorporate more physical activity. So some ways to do that. Uh, it might be walking to the local restaurant for dinner or walking to the grocery store or walking up to the cafeteria on campus. All of these things are going to increase physical activity if you get rid of the use of your car to make those short distance trips you'll be increasing physical activity in addition body mass responds and changes in body mass respond to endurance exercise and to strength training And they respond in two different ways. Endurance exercise utilizes fat as a preferential energy source. Not that we're not using things like glucose, but endurance exercise 
in that lower range uh, of your target heart rate, 65% up to about 80%, you're going to have a high utilization of fat to generate your ATP, to generate energy that's required to fuel the exercise. Whereas strength training increases muscle mass. And muscle is a very metabolically active tissue. The more muscle mass an individual has, the more ATP and energy that is required in order to maintain that particular tissue. Now the last change of lifestyle is to modify your energy intake. And it's important to have a moderate energy intake and to avoid excessive amounts or excessive consumption of calories. Uh, and really to have a balanced diet rather than a fat heavy or a carbohydrate heavy diet, to have a moderate energy intake that balances out the diet in such a way that you're intaking adequate amounts of carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. That's all I have for body composition.